Okay, so here we go on the demo, and uh, I'm going to try and be as quick as I can, uh, but this is a fairly lengthy piece, so please follow along as we go, and hopefully you're doing it simultaneously. We'll also be doing it in class as well, but uh, just in case, here you go, just in case you need to catch up or you need any help along the way. So first thing I'm doing, I'm building a brand new project in console app.net framework as usual. I called it oop demo, and I just put it in a folder where I can find it later on. And hit OK. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to build a shape management program. And all it's going to really manage is rectangles. We'll see, and we might add a little bit more to it. Uh, but that's the basics for now. So we're going to have three classes. We're going to have the main.cs, sorry, program.cs, which is going to be our driver class. We're going to have a rectangle manager which is gonna manage all of our rectangles. Now I do need to be clear, not all object-oriented programs need a manager class to manage the various types of things. So for example, in a, uh, in a game where I have like coins and everything like that, I wouldn't need a coin manager uh, where I place all the coins in a level, I would just have, say, for example, a list of coin objects. It depends on what you're doing and whether it makes sense to do so or not. And that's going to come with a little bit more practice and experience. For this example, we are actually going to use a manager. So I'm going to create the two classes that we're going to use. So the first thing, to create a new class, I'm going to right-click over here on my Solution Explorer, and I can say Add Class. Or I can go over here, and I can say Project add class whatever you're more comfortable with I prefer to go from the solution explorer because that's just the way I've always done things so add class we get a little pop-up we just want a default class and we're gonna give it a re we're gonna rename it and remember don't get rid of the dots yes or nothing will work so we're gonna call this rectangle manager and just hit add and you see we got multiple tabs going now I'm gonna add the next one that we're gonna need as well add class and we're gonna call this one rect short for rectangle. I don't want to use rectangle because that's already used in things like mono game and everything like that. So if we ever did decide to cross over, we don't want to get things confused. So our main.cs, our program.cs, sorry, this is going to be basically our interface between the user and all the objects that we're going to be creating. The rectangle manager, it's going to own and call all the functionality of the rectangles. That means that our driver class is never going to be directly interacting with any single rectangle. They're only going to be interacting with, or it's only going to be interacting with the manager. Then the manager will interact with the rectangle. This is very similar to the whole bank teller and you walking in. So you'd walk into the driver, which is the bank, and you'd talk to the teller, which is the, the manager, and that manager would then verify, and then it would interact with the objects behind, such as your bank account, okay? Our rect will be our basic rectangle class that will, re that will represent each rectangle from start to finish. So the question is, where do we actually start? Well, my personal preference is to always start at the lowest common denominator. So if we think about it, the program.cs is going to own the rectangle manager. So the program.cs can't really exist until the rectangle manager has been created. Okay. But the rectangle manager is going to own rectangles. So it can't really exist until the rectangles exist. So our lowest common denominator here is the rectangles. It doesn't depend on any other classes to do what it needs to do. Okay. So... Uh, that's where basically where we're starting at. That's my personal preference to do things. You don't have to do that. You could also do it in pieces. Maybe you build part of the manager until you're at the point where you need rectangles. Then you go build the rectangles, come back. It's whatever you're most comfortable with, but um, I like to keep my mind focused on one thing at a time. So we've built our, let's go into our rect class, okay? So we can see our libraries are already here. We may need more. We'll see. I doubt it though. Um, we have our namespace. Now, if you're in, if you are in uh, Replit, it's not going to create the namespace. It's just going to create the class. So don't worry about that. That's not the end of the world. Uh, a lot of times, I like to make sure that this is public, uh, but it's not absolutely necessary. Okay, we'll come back to what that actually means uh, in not too distant future here. All right, so. Uh, now that we have our class, uh, we've set everything up, we got all of our libraries, the next step is start adding the chunks. So if you, were, if you remember the diagram that we looked at before, 
it had our libraries at the top and then the next thing inside was inside of our class was our global variables so this is our attributes so I'm gonna write out all the pieces that we're going to be creating as we go so we're gonna have our attributes first then we're gonna have our constructors then we're gonna have our accessors and modifiers sometimes we like to call these the getters and setters because it sounds more fun and it sounds like uh, we're having a good time while we do it and then finally we have our behaviors so those are the four sections that we're going to work with so let's start with our attributes okay now what we're going to do is we got to look at um we have to look at all the data that our rectangle is going to require what defines a rectangle in this case we're going to have four pieces of data that define our rectangle uh, width, so let's say int width, int height, great, so now we have width and height. We also may want to draw this on the screen, so we're going to get a color. So let's say console color, and let's, whatever that is, I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. And then finally, what display character do we want to use when we're drawing our rectangle? So let's say char, let's say display char. Okay. So this is what we're used to when we define our variables. There's nothing new here. This is exactly what we're seeing. The only difference you see is that you don't see me using the keyword static, but these are global variables. Why don't I have to use the keyword static? Well, remember the whole point to that before. We use static inside of our, inside of our program.cs because all of our logic was going inside the main method, which was also static, but there's nothing static here. So we don't need to make them static. It's just not necessary. Okay, so that's the first course of action. The next thing is encapsulation. Oh, well, how do we hide? How do we actually hide our information? Remember, encapsulation is the idea of hiding, um, hiding data and functionality as well as grouping data and functionality. The class is grouping it, but we still need to hide it. So we do that using one of three access modifiers access modifiers let me write this down access modifiers basically it modifies who can access the thing we're talking about that could be a variable or it could be an actual method itself so there are three access modifiers that we're going to learn here there's private there's protected and there is public so in order to fully encapsulate something, we want to use private. That means it's hidden, it's stuck, only this class has access to it, okay? Private means only this class has access to it. Great, okay, so what does that mean? So all we have to do is define every single one of our variables as private, great. We just put the keyword private before each one. Now, if we had an, if we had an actual rect object, uh, we wouldn't be able to access anything from an external class in order to use that. So private's what we're using right now. Now, if you remember a couple minutes ago, I put the word public here. Public has a different meaning. So if private is the most locked down, public is the most open. It means anybody with an instance of this class can access that. So basically, we, won't, we want the rest of the program to be able to create rectangles. All right. But I'm going to leave that out for now just because we're going to try and keep as many default settings as we can. So we keep this simple. So we want all of our data to be private. Great. So that's the first piece of the puzzle. We're done our attributes, nothing else. So the next piece is the constructor or constructors. We can have as many as we want. Remember what the purpose of a constructor is, is to be a method called by an external class, which means it needs a different access modifier. It can't use private because something else outside is going to use it. So it's the purpose of the constructor is to be a method called by an external class to create or construct an instance or object of this class. So the truth is a constructor is just a method, but it's a special method. So we know it needs to be public. Now, how do we specify that this is the constructor for this class? we call it the same as the class. Now, what do you notice it's missing? There's no return type. That's how the compiler knows that this is a constructor for the class, right? Because there's no return. It, it, a constructor is not allowed to return anything. It just doesn't do that. It just builds. Okay. So 
in this case, I can choose to put parameters in here. I can choose to say, well, I probably need a width, I probably need a length, or sorry, a width and a height and all that kind of information. Or I can, and then inside, that's where I'm going to start doing all my setup, right? So the constructor is a method, it has the same name as a class, but it has no return type, not even a void. The logic constructor, it does a few basic actions. It sets all the attributes to the starting values. So width, height, color, display, char, okay. And it executes any other extra code you may need to do setup. So the example I gave in the previous video was when we have a deck of cards, we might shuffle those cards doing a little bit of extra functionality. So now we know two access modifiers. Private means only this class can access it. Public means anybody with an instance of this class can access it. All right. All right. So we want to set this up. What do we want our rectangle to have for a constructor? Well, let's just give it some default values. So let's say, you know what, if you build a rectangle, it's going to have a width of five. It's going to have a height of five. So it's going to be basically a square. And we'll set its color equal to, um, let's say white. So it's going to be a white rectangle or white square. And we'll say the display char will equal capital X. Okay. So this is our constructor. So if we were ever to build a rectangle, every rectangle we build is now going to be five, five by five white and use X's to draw itself. Well, that's not very useful. I don't want all my rectangles to be exactly the same size. So if you remember, we're also allowed to have a second constructor. We can have as many constructors as we want, really. So what we're going to do is we are going to create what we call an an overridden constructor, okay, an overridden constructor. So this would be called the default constructor because it gives all of the data default values. There's no parameters. Now the overridden constructor, we can specify data that we want to set up. So for example, I want a custom width. I want a custom height. I want a custom color and I want a custom display chart. So now we just now it's just a matter of setting up these things. So this is the one this is the one time we've ever seen that we can create two methods with the exact same name. But they do still differ. They don't have the same signature line. This one has no parameters. This one has got four. So now what I want to do is I want to set this width equal to that width. Hmm. I can't just write width equals width though. Because it doesn't know which one I'm talking about. That's why it's giving me an error. It's saying you're trying to assign it to itself. Remember how parameters work and how uh, local variables work inside of methods. Local variables basically say always use the local version as a default. So how do we access the global version? We use the keyword this. So I could say this dot width is assigned the local width. So that means the global width gets the local width. Okay, now we can just replicate this for the rest. This dot height is equal to height. This dot color is equal to color. And this dot display char is equal to display char. And just like that, we have a completely customizable rectangle. Great, so now we have a default constructor and an overloaded constructor. Perfect, we've learned how to, do, how to use the private access modifier and the public access modifier. The protected one's not coming for a few days, so we got a little bit of time to spare. No problem with that one. Okay, so now the next piece of the puzzle is accessors and modifiers or getters and setters. Getters and setters. What do I mean by that? So accessors and modifiers, you recall, these methods are used by external classes, which means they're gonna be public, to indirectly interact with the encapsulated private data. So this is like you trying to ask the bank teller for your money. They're not gonna let you in the vault. They're not gonna let you touch anything. So this is the same idea. We're gonna create a public interface for the other classes, so public methods, so the other classes can do things like, say something like uh, set the dimensions, all right? So it allows us to uh, modify things. Now, it's usually dealing with our attributes. Accessors and modifiers. Accessors are meant to retrieve data. Modifiers are meant to modify or change data. 
Okay. Hmm. Not all attributes should have accessors and modifiers. So for example, if you had a human class, you wouldn't make a modifier for somebody's eye color. You can't change that. That is what it is. It's set in stone. You were born with that eye color. You're going to die with that eye color. Can't change it. Now, you might have an accessor, though, to retrieve what that eye color is. Okay? So we always have to look at each attribute and decide, well, do I want external things to be able to change these? Maybe. Maybe not. So let's dig into this a little bit. Do we need accessors and modifiers for all of these? Well, I think it's pretty safe to create accessors for all of them because some external class may need the individual data. Okay, so let's create accessors first. So they need to be public and they're basically going to return the individual values. That's all they're doing. They're just returning the data. Okay, so what that means is I need to return each one of these width, height, color, and display char. So let's do width first, public int get width. That's how I know that this is an accessor or a getter. Do I need any parameters to get the width? No, not at all. I'm just going to return the width. Awesome. So that's the width. Now we're going to add the other four in there or the other three in there. So we have height. Oops. Those are both ints. But then we have to get the color, so we have to change our return type to console color. And we're going to say get color. And then finally, we have one last one for the display char. Let's say get display. Well, we'll just say, well, yeah, we'll say get display char. Again, we don't need any parameters for this. We're just going to return it. No, it's not called char, it's called display char. Okay, so now we've got all of our getters done, but we don't have our setters. So think about the data. Which data do you want them to be able to change? Is it safe to change all these things? Does it make sense to change all these things? Well, yeah, sure, why not? Why can't you change the dimensions of a shape? Why can't you change its color? Why can't you change its display char? In this case, it actually makes sense to give them the ability to modify them all. So let's do that. So down in here, we're going to do now our setters. So again, they're going to be public because we want external classes to use them. Now, modifiers or setters, they typically do not return a result. However, sometimes you may want to, to say, for example, return whether it was a success or a failure, or maybe the, uh, the, mod the new modified value or something like that, right? So in this case, we don't really need to do that. So we're just going to say public void. So let's say, for example, I want to set the width of our rectangle. Well, it needs a new width, so it needs one parameter. Now, I could just say this.width is equal to width, and that would modify it. However, that defeats the whole purpose that we talked about before with encapsulation about security and reliability. I have no idea whether that width that's passed in as a parameter is a safe value or not. So I want to verify that. I want to make sure that, hey, is it actually a safe value? Well, what is a safe value? Any number greater than zero is fine. So we could put an if statement around that. So if width is greater than zero, then change it. Otherwise, do nothing. Oops, I think I killed a bracket somewhere. There we go. So that's set width. Well, set height's gonna be basically the same, so let's copy paste it. So we have height. And change this to height. And we want to make sure this is height. And finally, these, I'm going to copy paste these. This is getting ridiculous. Okay, so now we have the width and the height. Okay, so what's next? The color. Do I need to do any safety checks on color? No, not really, because you a color is a color. As long if that data, if they were able to call this method, the compiler would have validated whether the color they passed in was actually a color or not. So we should be safe. So we could just say public void set color. And they're gonna pass in a console color. And we're just going to assign it. This.color is equal to the new color. Now some people, I should come back up to the default constructor for a second. 
or sorry, the overloaded constructor. Some people don't like doing this strategy where they say like the global version is equal to local version. So the way they'll get around it is they'll just give the local variable a different variable name. So it might be like new width and new height. So then they could just say width equals new width. And I just, I just came up to my mind now because I could have done the exact same thing down in here. I prefer to keep the naming simple and consistent. So that way I always know which data I'm working with and it, it gets tiresome and hard to come up with so many different names. So just keep it simple. So the last one is the display char. And we're kind of in the same boat as the color. As long as it was safely able to pass in that color in the first place, it should be okay. The problem with the width and height is negative 72 is, is a valid integer. So it would, the compiler wouldn't have any problems with that. Okay, so public uh, void set display char. Oops, and we need our new display char. My fingers are cold, I'm in my basement, so it's uh, <laughs> struggling to type here. All right, so we got our display char. This dot display char is equal to display char. All right, so now looking at our class, we have our libraries, we have our attributes, we have, our, we have two constructors, we have a, a default constructor and an overloaded constructor. We have all of our accessors. We have all of our modifiers. Great. So what's left? Just the behaviors. Hmm. Well, this is an interesting one. So when we're talking about behaviors, well, behaviors are actions the object or the class can perform. Some are going to be private, kind of like that shuffle behavior that we talked about with the deck. Others are meant to be called by external classes, so they'll need to be public. So private ones we keep private, public ones we keep public. So what can a rectangle do? <laughs> Not a whole lot. Uh, well, it can draw itself, I guess. We can calculate its surface area. We can display its dimensions. And I suppose we could rotate it. If we rotate it by 90 degrees, all we have to really do is uh, swap the width and the height and we'll get a perfect, uh, we'll get a perfect rotation. Okay. So let's write this down. So we want, we want to be able to draw. We want to be able to, uh, get the surface area. We want to be able to display dimension and we want to be able to rotate our shape, our, our rectangle. So which of these should be private and which one of these should be public? Should any of these be private. Hmm. Well, the draw, that's going to be called by an external class. So that definitely should be public. Okay. What about surface area? Well, the external stuff isn't going to be doing that. That's going to be all internal because it's going to be used by this display dimensions method. It's going to display the width and height and probably the area, I guess. And then the rotate, well, I guess that's going to be public too, because that's going to be external. So the only one that we have private is surface area. Now, which order should you be doing things in though? Should I be doing all public first or all private first? I like to get my private things done first. You don't have to, but for me, that's probably the best course of action, okay? So, um, we have two choices here when we say calculate the surface area. So it's going to be private and now when we're talking about calculating the surface area, are we gonna store that surface area or are we gonna recalculate it every single time we want to display the dimensions on the screen? That's a call, that's a judgment call. We can choose to, we don't have to, but we could. So in this case, let's try and keep it as simple as possible. We'll just recalculate it. Although if I were to build this program, I would probably store it and then only calculate it whenever the dimensions are changed. That would make life a lot easier or a lot more efficient, okay? But the, uh, the, uh, on the other hand, by not doing that, we don't have to waste the storage. So really, it's a comparison between um, effort versus storage, as it usually is, right? But in this case, let's say we're going to, we're going to prioritize storage, which means we're going to calculate it on the spot. So we're going to say private int calc area. And all this thing is going to do is return the air surface area of our shape, which should just be with time site. Don't need anything special there. Okay. 
So what's the next easiest thing to do? Um, so we have three other things. We got draw, display dimensions, and rotate. Let's save draw for a minute because that's probably going to be the more complicated one. Okay, so let, let's do, let's say display dimensions. So let's say public void display dimensions. Now, it doesn't need any parameters because it has all of its own data. It doesn't need anything to do its job. So all we have to do is write it on the screen. What do we want to display? We want to display the width, the height, and the surface area. We should probably give units, um, but the problem is we don't have units. They're, they're, they're characters, I guess. So I guess characters are our units. So let's try this. Console.WriteLine. And we want to display the width first. And so we'll do that and we'll add on the width value. And I guess we'll add on the keyword chars. Okay, I guess we can put a little space in there too, that might help. And then we wanna do height, but let's try and keep it all in one line. So what we'll do is we'll separate it by a vertical bar just so we can see the difference between the data. And we'll add on to the height. And we'll add on the chars. And then finally, we have to do the uh, area. Now in this case, we don't have the area, so we're actually gonna to have to call our method, calc area. So this is an example of us using our private method here. No external method has the ability to use calc area. No external class has the ability to use calc area. They wouldn't even know it existed. And then finally, we gotta put in our units, which is chars squared, I guess. Yeah, chars squared. And that's it. So now we have our display dimensions. It's going to display all three of those things. Okay. So let's go to rotate next. What does rotate mean? All it really means is swap your width and height. That's it. Well, we did this. We've done this in grade 10. We did it in grade 11. So you should know how to swap the values in two variables by now. Public, uh, void, and we're going to say rotate. And all we're going to do is switch the width and height. So if you guys remember, we need a third variable. Let's say int temp. It's an int because my width and height are ints. I'm going to set this equal to the width. Now I'm going to assign the width equal to the height. Now some of you might be like, why aren't you writing this dot width and this dot height? I don't need to in this case because there's no local width and height. So the only one that it knows about is the global one. And then finally, height is going to be equal to temp. Okay, so now we have rotate. And the final piece to the puzzle, ladies and gentlemen, is draw. What does that actually mean? Well, let's say draw does the following thing. Let's say it, um, let's put a little comments here. Let's say it's going to display the dimensions, even though the, the user can, ex or the other classes can do that as well. That's fine, we can do it, we can do it internally as well. And then it's going to, draw the display char for the entire surface area for the surface for the surface area in the shape's color in the rec's color okay so we got a little bit to do here so first of all we got to display dimensions well the good news is that's not hard we all we have to do is call the method we already did the work for it so we just say display dimensions. Great. And now we want to draw the display char for the entire surface area in the rex color. Ooh, that last piece is nice and easy for us. We know how to change color. So let's change our color. Console.foreground color equals color. Okay. We better remember to turn to reset it, otherwise, other things after this are going to be miscolored. So we're going to say console.reset color. And we'll do the work for actually drawing it in between. Okay. So we can get rid of this comment now. So what does that mean? How do I do this? Well, basically what I want to do is I want to go through every possible, I guess, tile inside of our two-dimensional shape and put that character, our display chart, in that spot. What does that actually mean? It means it's a grid. Well, we know how to loop through grids. We just finished doing 2D arrays. So it's a nested for loop. Okay, so it's gonna be for int i is equal to zero, such that i is less than our height. So that's every row. 
I++, so I represents our rows, and then we need to do J, and J is less than our width, so this is our columns, J++, and then finally, now we just simply need to display the char. Console dot write. We're going to use write, not write line. Otherwise, everything will be on its own line. Display char. Okay. So if we think about this, for each row, go through every column. So let's say it's X and it's, I don't know, three by three. Then it'd go X, X, X. And then we'd come back up and now we'd go down to the next row. Oh, wait. It does, but it doesn't because we're using all console.write. Nothing is telling our cursor to go down to the next line. So we need one extra little bit. We're going to force it down to the next line right here with a console.write line. So that means after all, all columns are done, go down one line. So it forces it down the cursor. And that's our draw method. That is everything we got that we need here. This is everything that you need for our full rect class. Now, I wanted to point something out. In our class diagrams from the previous lesson, um, if you recall, I think, let me see if I can pull it up. So this is our class diagram from the previous lesson. We want to be able to illustrate which of these things is private, protected, and public. So the way we do that is we put a little symbol before each one of uh, these little statements here to tell us which is which, private, protected, or public. So rather than writing the whole word private, protected, or public, we just use a single character symbol. Which symbol, you ask? I'm glad you asked. So whenever something is private, we use the minus symbol. Whenever something is protected, we use the, the symbol of many names. So this would be, I guess you would probably call it a hashtag. You could also call it a pound sign, a number sign, but its technical name is actually an octothorpe. But anyways, so we have our private is a minus sign, protected is hashtag, and public is a plus sign. So that means inside of the class diagrams, you would just write, let's see, I don't have my actual pen here. Right beside here, I'd write like, for example, this is supposed to be private, so I'd put a little, oh, that didn't work. Can I not write with my pencil? There we go. Let's see. I would put a little minus sign right there. That is that is going to be private. That's going to be private. That's going to be private. These might be public. So I'll put a plus sign. Plus sign. And honk would actually be a plus sign. And if I had any protected, I would use the hashtag. Okay? So we just prefix it just before uh, the actual um, statement itself. So that's how we separate our private and our protected. So just to, re just to remind you what each one of those does, private means only this class can access it, whether it is a variable or whether it is a method, which is what we have down here. Public means this class and any other class with an instance of this class can access it, but only that. Okay. So we have actually fully completed our rect class. If we run our program right now, it doesn't do anything. Hopefully it compiles. We didn't break anything. That's good. Uh, all we've done so far is create a support class. I want you to think of these classes as kind of like puzzle blocks. The driver class stitches everything together, but unless you've created instances of these classes, they don't actually do anything. They're just plans. They're templates. That's all they are. So we got to take the next step. So the next step is to create the rectangle manager class, okay? And I actually want you to pause the video here and I want you to go do it. I'm gonna bring up uh, on the PowerPoint for this, you can see what it looks like. So this is what I want you to do for you, for yours. I want you to create this rectangle manager, which has a bunch of private stuff and a, few, and a bunch of public stuff. So you're gonna have a list of rectangles, a list of recs. It's gonna track how many rectangles you're allowed to have in the manager. So the manager is going to have a maximum number. It's gonna have one constructor. We can see this is one constructor. So in our previous, uh, from your homework from last night, we didn't put constructors in the class diagrams because we didn't know they existed yet. But now that we do, constructors are something that actually needs to go in there. But you'll notice there's no return type. So we have our rectangle manager, which 
specifies how many max rectangles there are. Then we have a bunch of accessors and modifiers, get num recs, get max recs. Um, then we have add rectangle, which returns a bool. Was it successful? Remove rectangle. Was it successful? Draw rectangle. Was it successful? Void draw all rectangles. Draw, or sorry, display rectangle dimensions. Display all rectangle dimensions. Rotate rectangle. So you can see some of them have parameters based on index if they're trying to modify a specific rectangle. So over here, I have a description of what everything does. I'm not going to go over it. I'm going to pause the video. And when I resume, the class is going to be magically done. So you pause it as well. And when we meet back up, everything will be, will be at the same place. Okay. If you get stumped, that's okay. Uh, you can always take a look at mine. Okay, we're back now. Um, just want to quickly run through this because the video is getting long. Um, I created the the list. I created the max rex. I have two constructors. The default constructor, if you read the instructions on the previous page, it said that um, there should be a, a default one as well that sets it to three max rectangles. So that's what I did. Um, we have our regular uh, overloaded constructor. We have our get num rex and get max rex. They don't need any handling or anything like that, any special consideration. Uh, a lot of them are you returning a bool based on whether the rect, uh, whether there's either space. So for example, add a rectangle, we can only do that if there's space available, which means the count is less than max rex. But for all the other ones that are modifying or drawing, they're returning a bool that simply says, is the index passed in safe? Are there actually rectangles to physically draw or remove? That one specifically. So if the index passed in is two is not does not fit in the the range, then uh, don't do the work. Okay. Um, so this just goes through all of the different methods. Uh, feel free to uh, pause the video and go through them. So there's remove rectangle, draw rectangle, draw all rectangles, display rectangle dimensions, uh, display all rectangle dimensions, and finally rotate a specific rectangle. Okay. So that's pretty much it. And oh, I did forget one thing. I forgot to do this check at all of my previous ones here. Let's just back up a little bit. I forgot to do this because we also need to make sure that the index is valid on the low end as well. Silly me. There we go. So that should be uh, safe now. So the next and final step of the puzzle is the driver class. Right now, we've got all the puzzle pieces built but the program still does absolutely nothing. So that's where we get into our driver class. So our main program, right? So now that all the support classes are complete, it's time to connect them all together with the help of the driver class. So just a quick recall, the purpose of the driver class, sorry about that. The purpose of the driver class is to act as the interface for the user which then calls upon the objects to perform actions. Again, the driver class is not going to have any access to any of the rectangles directly. It's going to have to communicate with the rectangle manager, which is going to have to do the work. So we've already built our blueprints for the other ones, but have yet to actually kind of create any instances. We don't own a single uh, object yet in our entire program, right? So how do we actually create an object? Let's say, for example, not, not that this is going to stay, but let's say, for example, I wanted to create a rectangle here. I could do that technically. It doesn't really follow what our goal is here, but let's say I wanted to create a rectangle. So in order to do this, you've already done this many, many times in the past with other objects, things like rect, uh, things like uh, texture 2Ds, uh, when we did mono game, uh, when we do standard uh, C sharp, like console programs, the random uh, the random RNG, that's an object. These are things you've already done. So there's nothing new here. It's just now you're calling your own work. So the first thing we have to do is when we want to create a new object, we have to specify the name of the object, the type. In this case, it acts like our variable type. So in this case, I want to create a rect. And I am going to call it, I got to give it a name. I don't know, let's call it rec1, right? We're, this is just a demo, so we're just trying it out. So this, technically speaking, that has defined the object, but it hasn't been set up yet. It hasn't been instantiated. So this will happen at compile time. The compiler will go over and says, hey, I now have a variable of type rect, and it's called rec1. Now, if you tried to do anything on this right now, you would get an error. So if I said rec1 dot, say, for example, draw, 
it's going to fail. It's not going to let me do this because rec1 doesn't have a value. It's unassigned. It's currently null, N-U-L-L, -L, null. So I have to finish the job. I have to instantiate the object. That's where we call the constructor. So we need to call one of these two constructors that we did up here, either the default constructor or the overloaded constructor. It knows the difference based on the parameters that you pass in when you call it. So for example, if I wanted to create just a default rectangle, I could say equals new. So this is how we call a constructor, new keyword, and then the name of the constructor, in this case, just rect. Now, when I open up the brackets, you'll see that there's two options, one and two. One is the default constructor there, no parameters, and two has all the other ones. Let's just create a default one for now. And you can see now that we call rec1.draw, it should actually do something. Now, this is still a console program, so it'll disappear when it's done. So let's put a console.read line at the end for now. And then we're going to run our program. So there we go. We get our width of five chars, our height of five chars, our area is 25 chars squared. I see I forgot a space there. We'll have to go back to some fix that. But this is the actual drawing of our rectangle, five by five. I know it looks taller than it is wide. That's just because characters are taller than they are wider. So let's go quickly go back to our uh, rectangle and fix that comment. There should be a space right there. There we go. We go back to our program. And if I wanted to create or use the overloaded constructor, I would just have to specify all the data needed. So in this case, I need a width. So let's say, I don't know, let's make it 10 wide and let's make it five high. And now a color. So let's say console color dot, I don't know, blue. And then finally a display char. I am going to use, I'm going to use space, just a space. You're like, well, that's not really going to show up. No, you're probably right. So let's not use space. It'll just look like blank. There are characters that we used um, in previous things where um, they show up like solid blocks and that would fill it in. So that's an option too. Uh, we did that. I showed you that during, um, I believe it was tic-tac-toe. But anyways, so let's use, I don't know. Let's use a big O. I know you guys love X's and O's right now. So let's try running it. So now we have 10 wide, five high, and that looks roughly like a square now because the characters are roughly twice as high as they are wide. So it looks funky, but that's the way it is. And we still get the proper calculation. Okay, now we didn't actually want to do any of this though. This is just to demonstrate how to actually create an instance of a class. And we can have as many of these as we would like. So for example, let's create a second rectangle and let's make this one, I don't know, 20 by 15 and let's make it red and we will use um, let's use the at symbol and now let's draw that one to rec one or sorry two dot draw so I can only access the public things so when I run this we get both of our stuff showing up that's good looks good now watch, watch what I mean by that. So if we look in rectangle, see we have private data here. I cannot access that width, the height. So if I'm in here and I type in, say for example, rec two dot, the width and height do not show up, but the get width does because I made that public. Same with set color. So I can only access the public things that I created. That's the whole point of the access modifiers. All right. So let's get rid of this. So now we're back to kind of like a default here. So our last piece of the puzzle is what we need to do is we need to determine what actions the user can perform. What do we want them to be able to do? So I don't know. Let's see. Uh, we want them to be able to add a new rectangle, remove a rectangle, rotate a rectangle, draw a rectangle, show a rectangle's dimensions, draw all the rectangles, show all the rectangles dimensions, and exit the program. Hmm. All of this functionality requires the rectangle manager object. So let's start by actually creating a rectangle manager object. And let's give it like a maximum size of five. So we're gonna create our rectangle manager. Okay, I'll call it, um, 
rec m n g r rec manager great okay i haven't actually instantiated it yet i could stop there and i could instantiate it down here if i want i could say rec manager equals new rectangle manager and then i'd have to specify all the data in which case we said five okay so again it's complaining right now. Why is it complaining? Well, because we're in the main driver class and I'm trying to use it inside of the main method, which means I need that static keyword because it's global. Do I even want it to be global? Does it need to be global? No, probably not. So I can actually, unless I'm using it in other parts of my program, doesn't make sense to make it global. We'll leave it there for now. So maybe like, why did you split this up, Mr. Lane? I didn't have to. I could have done this piece right here like that and not had this line of code. I was just showing you that we can split it up and sometimes it's absolutely necessary that we do split it up because we may not know, for example, that five until the program is actually running. Maybe we got that from the user. It might be like, how big do you want your rectangle manager to be, right? So it is um, something to keep in mind. You can actually split it up should you choose to, okay? All right, so now that we have our uh, rectangle manager, it's basically up to, up to us now to create a user interface and as much error handling as needed to allow the user to safely interact with this. So there's quite a bit going on here. So I'm actually gonna pause the video and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna show you the finished version of it because there's too much for me to do that on the video. It's gonna add another half an hour to the actual video itself. So let me just pause real quick. Okay. All done. Now, um, I did want to point out that if you go to the PowerPoint, you'll see that there are links to um, the project in various states as we're going. So you can see as it's progressed. Um, so you can see the final solution on there as well. So I wanted to point out a few things before we got too deep. Uh, you'll notice that I've made my constants private. Now, constants are special. You can actually access these constants from external classes if, if they were made public. So let's say, for example, I wanted to access this no option constant, and I've made this public. I can now access this, this from any class in the entire program. Why? Because it's constant and it's public. Other variables, like regular variables, I wouldn't be able to do that unless... Um, unless I had an instance of the class. But when things are constant or static, if you make them public, you can access them anywhere. So for example, if I had a random number generator that I wanted to use everywhere in my program, I could say public random RNG equals new random. And what that allows me to do is now I can access this thing. Uh, it's an object, so I can access this thing anywhere um, if I have an instance of this. Uh, sorry, I need to make this static. Okay, so what does that mean? So let's say, for example, I'm in rect and I want to access that no option thing. So inside of here, how do I get at it? Well, let's say I wanted to use it in here. I could actually say uh, program, because that's the name of the file it's in, dot no option. There it is. I can actually access that. And that will give me the actual value of that variable. You can see that it pops up as a value of zero. I can also access the random number generator. So I could say program dot RNG dot next and give it whatever. And that will allow me to access data. I can access that method, that, that object as well. Again, this only works with static and constant uh, values, but it is a very, very handy trick. You don't want it to make everything static. You'd only want to do things that are meant to be project wide, like a random number generator, for example, because you only want one in your entire program. Otherwise, your numbers won't be very random. Uh, next thing I wanted to talk to you about was if you have a class and it's made up of nothing but data, uh, so the attributes and accessors and modifiers, we call that a data class. It means you have no extra behaviors or anything like that. Its sole purpose is just a container for data and being able to manipulate that data. It's a pretty common thing in a lot of different projects. Uh, so there are faster ways to handle attributes like uh, in terms of accessors and modifiers. So if we go to a rect, for example, 
Um, we have all the different accessors and modifiers for all of these different values. There is another thing out there that does everything that these accessors, these getters and setters do in a much faster way. It's called properties. So if you look up C sharp properties, it will actually give you a faster way of doing things. Now, that being said, I don't directly teach it because properties don't exist in every programming language. And I try to keep things a little bit more general so you can then go apply them in anything that you work with. Okay, so without further ado, let's have a quick look at what this program does. I have all of these constants which represent my various menu options. So nothing, add, remove, rotate, draw, draw all, display, display all, and exit. So at the very beginning, I say they haven't entered anything yet. I'm going to keep looping as long as they haven't chosen to exit. I'm going to display the menu to them. I'm going to clear the screen, and based on what they choose, I'm going to perform the appropriate action. So each one of these has its own uh, setup. So let's say, for example, there's the display menu. Let's say, for example, uh, we go to, uh, I'll come back to that in one second, add rectangle. So what add rectangle is going to do is it's going to get all the appropriate data from the user. So for example, I'm going to ask them for a width and a height. And I'm asking them to enter a number between the range 1 and 40 for the, range, for the uh, width and between 1 and 20 for the height. Why? Because I want it to all fit on the screen. Now you might be like, well, what is this method? Get int in range. This is me creating helper methods to ensure that the data that the user enters in is valid. So I have a prompt, a min and a max value for them to choose a number between the range. And I say, keep asking while the numbers they entered are outside of my min or max, because that's a problem. So I clear the screen, I prompt them, I ask them for it and I read it in, I parse it. And as long as it's valid or not valid, I'm going to give them the appropriate message. So it will stay in this method until they give me a number in that range. Awesome. I have a similar thing for, uh, I use the, the method again for get uh, color number in range. Why? So I get them to choose a color number from the colors I'm specifying. This allows me to make sure that the user's not really typing anything error prone in, they're just simply choosing a number. I have another method that's similar to my get int in range. Right here we have get rectangle index. So I'm asking them for a rectangle, but I'm asking them for a number that's actually within the boundaries of the rectangle, of my rectangle collection, my, my rectangle manager. So that way if there's no rectangles, then it's going to tell them that. If there is rectangles, um, then it's going to uh, actually go through the process and retrieve it and keep going until I get a valid one, okay? So those are my two helper methods. And then it's just a matter of uh, setting everything up. So for example, here's add rectangle. I got the width, the height. I got the color that they chose. And then I set up my rectangle. You notice I did not instantiate it yet. That's because I don't have all the data yet. So I can't. So I'm creating it, but I'll instantiate it later. So once I got the display char, I'm gonna set my color based on what color number they chose. So for example, if they chose one, I'm gonna set it to red. Two is blue, three is green, four is yellow, and five is white. And then um, here's me actually instantiating it using all the data that I just set up. Once I've done that, I'm now calling rectmanager.addRectangle. You know what? That might result in a success or a failure because if there's not space, it's gonna fail. In which case, I'll display a message to the user. If this failed, display add failed, press enter to continue. If it worked, we say add succeeded. So let's try that out. So here's the menu. Let's try adding a rectangle. Enter the rectangle width. So let's say, I don't know, 20 or yeah, 25 and a height of, I don't know, 12. Which color do I want? Let's go with uh, four, yellow. And what character will we use? We'll use, I don't know, P. There we go. Add succeeded, press enter to continue. So now that I've added a rectangle, I can start doing things like drawing. Draw a rectangle. Choose a rectangle by its index on the left. Oh, there, I will choose number one, please. And there's my rectangle and all of its data. So if I say draw all rectangles, it's gonna draw all the ones that exist. Let's see, if I say, um, show the dimensions of a rectangle. I have to choose the rectangle I want to show. And there we go. And number seven will show dimensions of all the rectangles. I only have one. And then finally eight will exit. So we can also remove one. So if I remove the only one I have, it removes succeeded. 
If I try to remove another one, no rectangles available. Right? If I try to rotate one, no rectangles available. So the biggest pain to handle when we're dealing with stuff like this is error handling, user interface stuff in terms of like all the possible ways that the user can mess up our program. And the, the easiest way to get around that is make sure that they're typing as little as possible. Don't give them free reign to type anything they want unless that's actually a necessity. Like for example, asking them to enter their name. Instead, give them choices and then restrict those choices and ensure that whatever they choose is within those choices. And all of a sudden your error handling becomes much more minimal and it's a lot easier to work with. Okay. As I said before, this video was a long one, um, but that is the end. We have come to